Uh, this evening we are going to study a parable of Jesus. It's found in Luke 18 and verses 1 through 8. Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 8. Uh, but before we uh, open God's word, we want to pray. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for God's guidance as we open his word. Father in heaven, uh, we come before you to thank you for the privilege of beginning another Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, that you not only give us things, but you give us your time. Because relationships are good, good relationships are based on time, spending time together. So we thank you for giving us the Sabbath, where we can get away from everything, ours, and just focus on you. We ask that as we open your word, that your Holy Spirit will be present here, that uh, through the ministry of your angels, minds will be opened and uh, hearts will be softened, and that we will be empowered to live as your remnant in these last days. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, and we know that you have heard us because we come boldly to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> this parable is known as the parable of the unjust judge. But I have always believed that that's the wrong name for the parable. Because the parable should not be called the unjust judge, it should be called the parable of the persistent widow. Because really, uh, central to the story is the persistence of the widow. Now what I'm going to do first is we're going to read uh, the parable. It's uh, short, it's only eight verses. <clears throat> and then we are going to um, interpret what Jesus wanted to teach through this parable. It reads in the following way. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from our adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, And shall not God avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? That's the parable. Now, let's take a look at the central thoughts of this parable. First of all, Jesus clearly tells us what the central lesson of the parable is. It actually has two parts. In verse 1, it says, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray. The Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing. And then it says, and not lose heart. Always pray and never give up. So those are the two lessons that Jesus wanted to teach through this parable, the central lessons, that we always ought to pray and we should never give up. We should never lose our patience in prayer. And then in verse 2, the first part of the verse, you have a judge. It says, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Uh, so you have the two lessons of the parable. And then one of the protagonists of the parable is the judge. And it says here that the judge did not fear God nor did he regard man. Then the next protagonist that we have, or actor that we have in this parable, is the widow. And uh, this is found in uh, chapter 18 in verse 3. It says, now there was a widow in that city. So, uh, so far we have two actors. We have, first of all, a judge. Now we have a widow. 
And uh, then I want you to notice that the next thought that we have in the parable is that this widow was a very persistent person. It continues saying in chapter 18, verse 3, the second half of the verse, now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. Now, as you read the parable, and uh, you read the tense of the verb here, it says she came to him saying. The, the word came uh, might indicate that she came once or she came twice. But a little later on in the parable, we're going to find that she, not, she did not come once or twice. She kept coming and coming and coming and coming and did not give up. So really, uh, it should be translated, she continued coming to the judge, saying, get justice for me from my adversary. You see, this widow had an independent, unyielding, and defiant perseverance in the face of aggressive misfortune. She was not about to give up. And then in this parable, the next actor that we have is an individual that is called the adversary. In other words, he is the enemy of this widow. Now, for theologians who have studied this parable, they've concluded that what happened in the parable is that this uh, woman's husband uh, actually owed creditors great sums of money. And then he died. Maybe he died suddenly, we don't know. But uh, he died out of his time. And uh, so uh, when he died, all of the creditors came after his assets and took everything that the husband had left to the widow to get the money that the husband owed. So this widow, she basically was destitute. She had no children, she had no home, she had no money, evidently she had no relatives and friends. Her only hope was found in the judge doing justice to her against her adversary. And then the next element that we have in the parable is that there's a delay. Uh, the judge, for a significant period of time, simply ignores the pleas of this woman, even though she continues coming and coming and coming. Notice chapter 18 and verses 4 and 5. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, in other words, she's a pest. She keeps on coming and coming and coming, now notice the reason why he's going to give her what she asked for. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. <laughs> so what was the motivation for the judge doing justice to the widow? It wasn't because he loved the widow. It was because he wanted to get the widow off his back. He was tired of having her come and come and come to him seeking for justice. So, is the, are the main elements of the parable clear? Once again, two lessons. We always ought to pray, never give up. In the parable, there's a judge. In the parable, there's a widow who is destitute of everything. She's lost everything that her husband had. Then you have an adversary who's the one who took everything from the widow. And she keeps on coming to the judge but the judge delays to answer her pleas. Now a question that we need to ask is to what period of history does this parable especially apply? Now it's clear that it applies to all periods of human history because we always ought to pray and we should never give up. So the lesson of the parable is for God's people at all times. But this parable applies especially to the end time. It applies especially to the very end of time. In fact, during the time of trouble, we're going to notice that never was since the history of the world began. You say, how do we know that this applies especially to the last remnant of time? Two reasons. Number one, if you look at chapter 17, the chapter immediately preceding this one, you're going to notice that Jesus was talking about, as it was in the days of Noah, 
so will it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. And then Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then comes the parable. So the immediately preceding context of the parable has to do with events relating to the second coming. And then the parable ends also by referring to the second coming. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? So because the parable is sandwiched between uh, references to the second coming of Jesus, we know that the parable has special relevance to those who will be alive when Jesus returns to this earth. Now this parable then has an end time application. You know, we don't have to really guess at what the parable means because Jesus explained the meaning of the parable. Now let's take a look at the main protagonist of the parable and see who they represent at the end of time. But before we do, I want to read Luke 18, verses 6 through 8, where Jesus explains the meaning of the parable. You know, Jesus not always explained his parables. Sometimes Jesus would give a parable and he would leave the interpretation to the hearers. But in this case, Jesus explained the meaning of the parable and he also explained that it applies to the very end of time. It says in uh, Luke 18 and verse 6, Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, however that means, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? So you notice that there's an end time dimension to this particular parable. Now let's interpret the meaning of the uh, protagonists or the actors in the parable so that we can understand what God wanted to teach. Now, first of all, let's talk about the widow. Who does the widow represent? We don't have to guess. Did you notice that in the explanation, Jesus says, shall God not avenge his own elect? So whom does the widow represent? The widow represents the elect. Another way of saying it is the? The chosen, that's right. So the widow represents the elect. Now the question is, in the Gospels, when do the elect especially live? Go with me to Matthew 24, and we'll read verse 22, and then we'll read verse 24. Now if you look at the context of this, uh, the previous verses, it speaks about a time of trouble such as never has been, nor ever will be. This is the final great tribulation on planet Earth after the close of probation. It's when God's people will be here, they will have lost all earthly support. And uh, we find in Matthew 24, verse 22, who the elect are during this period. It says, And except those days, that's the final time of trouble and tribulation, should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But, now notice this, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So when are the elect going to live according to Jesus? They are going to live during the time of tribulation or the time of trouble when those days are going to be what? Shortened. And then notice verse 24. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So when are the elect going to especially live, according to Jesus? They're going to live during the tribulation, the worst tribulation in the history of the world, at the very end of time. The book of Revelation refers to this group as the 144,000. Those who will be alive when Jesus comes. Those who will go through the final time of trouble such as never has been seen and will come forth from that time of trouble victorious. Now, uh, you know, some people get all caught up on whether the number is literal or the number is symbolic. 
Now, I believe that the number is symbolic. I think there are several good reasons. Um, and you can find uh, presentations that I've made on the 144,000. But that is not the important point. It does you no good to know if the number is literal or symbolic if you're alive and you're not in that group. <laughs> when we get to heaven, we will know if the number is literal or symbolic. Meanwhile, we need to make sure that we have the character of the 144,000. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They sing a song that no other generation can sing because they have an experience that no other generation has ever had. They were not defiled with the apostate harlots of Babylon. They, they, there's no deceit found in their mouths. They are without fault before the throne of God. This is the chosen generation. This is the end time generation. The f I like to call it the faithful generation. Amen. That is what is represented by this widow. And by the way, they will lose all earthly support. God's people during the time of trouble will have nothing, just like the widow. They will lose houses. They will lose automobiles. They will lose their money in the bank. Many of them will lose their freedom. The only thing that they will not lose is their life. Amen. But every other earthly support will be taken away. That is what is represented by this widow. The final end time church, the chosen, the elect, going through the time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. Now who does the judge represent in the end time? Well, you know, it's very clear that Jesus says that the judge represents God. Notice the explanation. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect? So the judge represents whom? God. But you say, now, Pastor, wait a minute. It says that he did not fear God and he did not regard man. How can he represent God? Well, he represents God by way of contrast. This is the way uh, that Jesus is arguing his case. He says, if an unjust judge will do justice to a widow to get her off his back, how much more will Jesus answer our pleas because he loves us? Amen. In other words, the motivation for answering is different. But God will answer the pleas of his elect. So in other words, as God's people are going through the time of trouble, they're patiently praying, they're pleading to the Lord for deliverance. God is listening. God is hearing. And he will eventually avenge his elect. Not because he wants to get them off his back because they keep on coming and coming, but because he loves them. Now, who does the adversary represent? The one who hates the widow? Well, we don't have to guess. The Greek word that is used here is the Greek word antidikon. This is not a common word in the New Testament. It's used only a few times. Another verse where this is used is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And uh, you can identify with this because you have lions in Kenya. <laughs> so you know how, how savage lions can be. Uh, I only have seen lions in the zoo. It says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your antidikon, the same word that is in the parable, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So who is the individual that is going to take everything away from God's people and leave them without any earthly support? It is Satan working upon the powers of the world to take everything from God's people. Freedom, houses, automobiles, money in the bank, everything except life. Now it's interesting that it says that the widow cried out to the judge. Now that expression, cry out, is really only one Greek word. It's the Greek word boao. And it describes an intense agonizing cry. This is not just a whimper. This is, this is an agonizing plea and cry. 
It's the same word, uh, for example, that's used in Matthew 27, verse 46, where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this, this widow, this end time church, in the time of trouble, that has lost everything because Satan has taken everything from them, is going to be crying out and pleading with God for God to deliver them from the adversary, from the enemy. But there will be a delay. God's people, however, will not give up because there's a delay. God will not immediately deliver His people from the time of trouble. In fact, you know, in many churches these days, Protestant churches, they believe that God is going to take away Christians from the earth before the tribulation. But the Bible teaches that God's people will go through the tribulation. They will be protected by God in the tribulation. And they, there will be a delay because they will go through this period of severe anguish and severe pain. But after the delay, God will intervene to deliver His people. This will be the Gethsemane of God's people. This will be the Calvary of God's people. You say, we actually have to go through Gethsemane and Calvary with Jesus? I'm going to read you a statement a little bit later on, which is very significant from the spirit of prophecy. Now in Luke chapter 18, verse 7, we find this delay described. It says, And shall God not avenge His own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. This is the New King James Version. I like the way that other versions express it. For example, the New International Version translates, will he keep putting them off? That's nice. The Jerusalem Bible states, will he not listen to their pleas even though he delays to help them? And the Weymouth translation says, although he delays vengeance on their behalf. So God's people will not be delivered immediately. That's why we need to learn to trust the Lord in the good times and in the bad times. By the way, the bad times are good times because the bad times develop our faith. Notice Isaiah chapter 54 and verses 7 and 8. Isaiah 54 verses 7 and 8. This is speaking about this period of tribulation, this end time tribulation. And uh, it says that God for a short moment is going to withdraw. Apparently it looks like he's, he's withdrawn his presence from his people. And you say, well, would God actually withdraw his presence from his people so that they don't even feel that God is there? Well, God did it with Jesus, didn't he? When Jesus was on the cross, what did Jesus cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the experience that God's people will go through. That's why we need to learn to pray without ceasing. We need to learn to pray without giving up in these times of relative prosperity. It says there in Isaiah 54, verses 7 and 8, God is speaking, For a mere moment I have forsaken you. So is God going to apparently forsake His people? You know, not really, because if God forsook his people, they would all be dead. But it appears like they've been forsaken. It feels that way, in other words. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. Amen. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Amen. So if we hang in there, in other words, if we persevere, if we don't give up, the deliverance is coming and the reward of the just judge is coming. Now, there are other stories in the Bible that illustrate the meaning of this particular parable. And I want to share some of those from uh, stories from both the Old and the New Testament. You remember the experience of Jacob. By the way, this time of trouble is called the time of whose trouble? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. So probably it would be a good idea for us to go and study a little bit about Jacob, you think? <laughs> of course, if it's a time of Jacob's trouble, it must be similar to the experience that Jacob went through. So let's review a little bit about the story of Jacob. 
The story is told, by the way, in Genesis chapter 32. As you know, Jacob lied to his father and he stole his brother's birthright. He committed grave sins. And because of this, he had to flee from his home. This time of trouble that the widow goes through is called the time of whose trouble? Jacob. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And so we need to go back and study the story of Jacob. And uh, I'm sure that you know the story. Jacob lied to his father and he stole the birthright, birthright from his brother. And so he had to flee from home. And as he was fleeing from home, uh, he stopped to rest. He laid on the ground, put his head on some stones as a pillow, and he went to sleep. And God gave him a dream. And in that dream, Jacob saw a ladder, a ladder that reached to the highest heaven and was firmly planted on the earth. And then God promised Jacob, he said, Jacob, your sin is forgiven. Uh, I will be with you wherever you go. I will protect you and I will bless you and I will bring you back to this land. God promised Jacob that he was forgiven and that he was going to be with him, protect him and bring him back to the land. Well, 20 years later, it was time to return to his land. And as he's returning, and he's coming to where the promised land is, he hears that his brother Esau, who is the Antidikon, who is the adversary, is coming against him with 400 choice men armed to the teeth. And of course, Jacob and his family are totally defenseless. They don't have any way of defending them themselves against this powerful enemy. And so Jacob, one evening goes by the brook Jabbok and he begins to pour out his heart in prayer to God such as the widow did. All night he struggled and he prayed. Let's read about this in Genesis 32 and verses 24 through 31. Jacob says, Lord deliver me. I fear my brother. I'm afraid that my sin that I committed 20 years ago is so great that, uh, that it's going to be impossible for you to protect me. It's going to be impossible for you to bless me. Well, the fact is, God had already said to Jacob that he was forgiven. God had already told him that he, that he was going to bless him and he was going to bring him back safely to his land. You know, one of the biggest problems that we have is that we uh, don't accept God's forgiveness because we don't feel forgiven. You know, why, why should we be sure that we're forgiven? It's because God says so. Amen. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, all we have to do is claim the promise. But we, let, we allow our feelings to get in the way. We say, oh, I don't feel forgiven. You know, I feel bad. And Accept God's word. Amen. Accept God's promise. Jacob was not able to after 20 years. And so now he's pouring out his heart in prayer to God in this severe crisis where the, the adversary is coming against him to destroy him and his family. Suddenly, as he's pouring out his, prayer, his heart in prayer to God, someone comes and lays hold of him. And he thinks that perhaps it's Esau, the enemy, or some other enemy. And so he starts struggling and fighting with this individual. And basically they struggle and fight and wrestle all night. And soon Jacob realizes that he is not fighting or wrestling with a common human being. He is struggling with the angel of the Lord. He is struggling with Jesus himself. And so uh, as the morning is beginning to dawn, uh, this... Uh, supernatural being touches his hip and it becomes disjointed and Jacob definitely knows now he says I know I'm not fighting against the human being I am struggling against the Lord and so the Bible tells us that Jacob uh, that the angel tells Jacob Jacob let me go for the sun is coming up and Jacob hangs on to him he says I will not let you go until you give me the assurance of your blessing and once again, uh, this is Jesus, by the way, he's the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. He's God, but he's the angel of the Lord. He's Michael the archangel. He's called the angel of his presence. He's called the prince of the host. He has many names in the Old Testament. Michael, your prince. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And so he says, let me go again. And Jacob says, no way. I'm, he hangs on to him. See, he's like this widow. He, he's not going to let go until he's certain that God has blessed him. And so then uh, the, this majestic being 
who is God, Jesus Christ, in his pre-incarnate form, says to Jacob, Jacob, what is your name? He says, well, he says, what is your name? He says, well, my name is Jacob. The name Jacob means supplanter. It means somebody who tries to occupy the position that belongs to somebody else. And you know, Jacob did that from the time he was born. He had his, his brother by, by the ankle wanting to be born first. <laughs> and so even Esau said, he, he's very appropriately named. His name is Supplanter. So he, he understood very well that the name had meaning. And so uh, he says, my name is Supplanter. And so uh, this majestic being says to him, your name will no longer be called Supplanter. Amen. Your name now will change because your character has changed. You have struggled with God and with men and you have overcome. Your name from now on will be called Israel, which means Prince of God. And the end of the story is that God delivered Jacob from the wrath of his brother. And his brother came to him in peace. Let's read about this in Genesis 32, verses 24 to 31. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, that is when the angels saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. Jacob must have been a pretty strong fellow. It says, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. You see, this is what you call prevailing prayer. And then verse 29, then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called, now notice the name that he gives this place. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. That is composed of two Hebrew words. Pen, which means face, and El, which means God. So basically it means the face of God. And then Jacob explains why he called that uh, place that name he says he called the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved is this a picture of what's going to happen with God's end time people yes it is let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 here's the end time application of the Jacob experience Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 it's talking about this time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world it says and at that time Michael shall stand up that great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people see he's the protector of God's people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never once since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall be what delivered everyone who is found written in the book so the experience that Jacob went through is illustrated by the parable of Jesus is there a remnant in the story of Jacob yes it's Jacob do you have an enemy or an adversary of Jacob yes his brother in the armies do you have uh, in this story a delay yes all night you have a delay Jacob struggling with this supernatural being do you have eventually the judge making justice or giving justice to Jacob absolutely so this is going to happen with all of God's people at the end of time now you also have the story of Job that illustrates this parable of Jesus let me ask you did Job lose everything that he had did he lose uh, his house? Yes. Did he lose uh, his possessions? Did he lose all of his beasts? Did he lose all of his children? Did he lose his health? Did he lose the support of his wife? Did he lose the support of his friends? What did Job have to lean on? Nothing except his relationship to God. And yet Job perseveres. You see, he has an enemy. Who was his enemy? You know from the first two chapters, his enemy that took everything from him was who? Satan. 
Satan. He's identified by name. And so Job goes through this severe time of trouble where he loses everything. He's like the widow. Does God answer Job immediately? How? Listen, chapters 1 and 2, you have uh, the story of Job, Satan taking everything away from Job. And then from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 38, Job is crying out to God and saying, Why are you silent? Why don't you answer me? I, I used my goods to help the needy. I had family worship. I was a spiritual leader to my family. Why, why is this happening? Why have you forsaken me? I haven't done anything to earn this. And he's complaining and crying out to God like this widow. Finally, when you get to chapter 38, God says to him, Now, uh, Job, now it's time for you to be quiet. My turn to talk. <clears throat> And so then God asks Job over 50 questions between chapter 38 and chapter 40. And, and he begins by saying, where were you when I created the world, little worm? Who are you to, to demand answers from me? Who are you to question me? And even though Job had said, I'm not going to talk again, you've made your point. After his experience, he says to God, now uh, please give me permission to talk once again. He says, I, I, had, I had understood by just what I heard about you, but now my eyes see. And he was delivered and he got twice as much as what he had before. So once again, you have the same elements of the parable. Do you have an individual who is the remnant who is persecuted by an adversary? Yes. Does he lose everything that he has? Absolutely. Does God delay to answer his continual pleas? Yes, but do, does God eventually intervene to deliver his servant? Yes. Does he give them greater prosperity than he had before? Yes. Absolutely. So you have an illustration of the parable in the story of Job. And by the way, the delay in the case of Job was a great blessing. In, in fact, he even understood it because in Job 23 verse 10, uh, Job said, when God has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knew that his trials were to purify and to consume his earthliness, his dependent, dependence on earthly things. And then you also have uh, the story of the three young men that were thrown into the fiery furnace, illustrates this parable. They would be the remnant. Who would be their enemy? Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar would be their adversary or their enemy. Uh, did the three young men go through a time of trouble? You don't think being thrown into a fiery furnace is a time of trouble? Did God deliver them immediately? No. Could God have delivered them before they were thrown into the fire? Yes. yes. But they went through the fiery furnace. But God was with them. Were they finally delivered from their enemy? They were delivered from their enemy. Because they had perseverant faith in God. In fact, they said to Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, God, the God that we serve is going to deliver us. And if he doesn't deliver us, we still are his servants. That has something to say about the so-called prosperity gospel. Which is very common in Protestantism today. They say, oh, plant a seed in my ministry and you're going to be rich. So what happens when you're not rich? The Bible doesn't teach that God wants everybody to be rich. You know, maybe the reason why they believe this is because they think that they can be rich here and then they'll be taken off in the rapture and they can be rich there too. <laughs> have your cake and eat it too, is the way that they say it. Now we also have a couple of New Testament examples that illustrate this, this parable. You remember the Syrophoenician woman who had a daughter who was gravely ill? You know, this illustrates <laughs> the faith that this widow had. Uh, this woman comes uh, behind where Jesus and the disciples are walking and she's crying out, Lord, have mercy on me, for my daughter is very sick. And if you read the story, Jesus continues walking and he simply ignores her like she's not there. And then the story tells us that the disciples, and she can hear what they're saying, uh, they say to Jesus, Lord, dispatch her because she's causing a scene. This is embarrassing, Lord. Tell her to leave. Well, perhaps if I had been her at that point, I would have said time to bail out. But she wasn't about to bail out. So she continues coming after Jesus. and She says, Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is sick. And so then Jesus says to her, turns around and says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Wow. She was a Gentile. So Jesus is saying, I wasn't sent to you. I was sent to Israel. Well, at that point, probably many of us would have left. But this woman, Jesus continues walking, and this woman says, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Heal my daughter. And then Jesus, to cap it all off, says, it's not good to take the bread of the children and throw it to the dogs. He's just called her a dog. But this woman had great faith. She had great perseverance in crying out to Jesus. And she says, yes, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Amen. And so Jesus now says, oh, woman, great is your faith. I have not found this faith in Israel. Amen. But the greatest example of this parable is the experience of Jesus. Did Jesus have an adversary at the end of his life? Yes. Who was his adversary? Yes. Well, he had many of them. He had Satan, the scribes, the Pharisees, Judas. He had many enemies that ganged up on him. So the widow, in this case, would represent Christ, who went through this terrible time of trouble in Gethsemane and on the cross. The adversary would represent the devil. Now, did God the Father delay to answer the pleas of Jesus? Did the Father delay to answer him? Of course he did. Did God deliver him from uh, suffering in the garden? No. Did God allow him to continue suffering in the garden? Yes. Did God allow Jesus to continue suffering on the cross? Yes. Of course he did. Did God allow Jesus to die? Yes. yes. So did the Father delay in answering the pleas of Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. So you have the faithful remnant who is Jesus. You had the adversary who is Satan who took everything from Jesus. By the way, Jesus didn't even have the clothes on. He had nothing earthly to lean on except his father when he was going through this time of trouble. And you have a delay in the story of Jesus. But let me ask you, did the father eventually intervene to deliver Jesus from his enemies? Yes, on resurrection morning, uh, the father sent two angels. One angel uh, took away the stone and sat on it. And as the spirit of prophecy describes it, the other angel stood in front of the tomb and cried out with a mighty voice that shook the earth and ripped the rocks open. He said, O oh, thou son of God, thy father calls thee. And then Jesus came out of the tomb with the life that was within himself. In other words, Jesus resurrected himself through his divine power, but he had to receive permission from his father. Because he was dependent upon his father. In fact, you say, well, well, where does the Bible say that? Well, if you go to John chapter 10, 17, and 18, Jesus says, I have authority to lay down my life, and I have authority to take up my, my life again. But then he says, this command I received from my father at the end of verse 18. And so the father calls him, and now he is delivered after going through this severe time of trouble where the enemy took everything from him, and after this, delay. Now let me read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy about us. We are going to go through, this, through the same experience that Jesus went through. And we need to develop a faith in these times to go through that period. The reason why Jesus was victorious was because he had an implicit faith in his Father. He did not give up. He did not go by feelings and by emotions. He trusted in the promises of his Father. His father said, if you are faithful, I, you can be certain that I will call you from the tomb. But if you're not faithful, you won't. Now, notice this statement from Ellen White, Review and Herald, April 14, 1896. This is a chilling statement. Review and Herald, April 14, 1896. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents. In other words, Satan and his angels will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial 
rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Did that register? She says that the devil and his angels, allied with human agents, are going to band together, and the same scenes that took place at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. And then she continues in this way. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends. Do you know what a fiend is? A fiend is a demon. So she says men will be transformed into fiends. And those who were created in the, in the, in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons. And Satan will see in an apostate race, his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. So there will be two groups of people at the end of time. Those who reflect fully the divine image and those who reflect fully the satanic image. And what we are doing now is going to, de is going to determine which side we are on. In times of prosperity, we have the tendency of forgetting God. In times of adversity, we have the tendency to remember Him. But during the time of trouble, it will be too late to remember Him. It's now in times of relative peace and relative tranquility that we must develop this kind of faith in the Lord. When trials come, when difficulties come, when obstacles come, whether it be economic, whether it be family, whether it be health, or whatever, we need to learn to peer, persevere in prayer to the Lord and not give up. Because the time is coming when we're going to need a deep experience of prayer. Why does God allow His people to go through this time of trouble? It would be much easier for God to say, I'm going to spare them the time of trouble. I'm just going to... I'm going to rapture them to heaven before the tribulation. That would be the easy way. But God allows his people to go through this period of anguish so that they learn to trust him. So that earthliness is consumed. So that everything that attaches us to this world is let loose. In fact, if you go with me to Isaiah 48 and verse 10, we find an explanation of why God allows his people to go through the fires of tribulation. Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 10. Here God is speaking and he says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Let me ask you, when the three young men came, fo came forth from the fiery furnace, do you think there was anything or anyone in the world that could ever shake their faith in God ever again? No. No. How about when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? Do you think anything in this world could have shaken his faith in the Lord after that experience? No. Those were strengthening experiences for those who went through this period. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 175, um, we find this remarkable statement by Ellen White. The Lord permits trials in order that we may be cleansed from earthliness from selfishness, from harsh, unchristlike traits of character. He suffers the deep waters of affliction to go over our souls in order that we may know him and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, in order that we may have deep heart longings to be cleansed from defilement and may come forth from the trial purer, holier and happier. Often we enter the furnace of trial with our souls darkened with selfishness. But if patient, under the crucial test, we shall come forth reflecting the divine character. And so here's the big question that Jesus ended his parable with. When the Son of Man comes, will he find the same kind of faith that the widow had on the earth? The answer is yes. Amen. In fact, the answer is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Speaking about the end time generation. It says, 
Here is the? By the way, that, that word patience is not really well translated. You know, there's, there's two words that are translated patience in the New Testament. One is the word makruthumia, which means long-suffering. It's translated long-suffering. Somebody who suffers for a long period of time. The word that is used here in Revelation 14, verse 12, is not the word um, makrothumia, which means long-suffering. It's the Greek word hupomone, which be is better translate to endure or to pers persevere. In other words, a better translation would be, here is the perseverance of the saints. It gives you a better picture of the widow, right? Here's the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The same faith that Jesus had. And so let's not go away from this uh, convention and go back to our old ways. Let's learn to depend on the Lord in every trial, in every test in every tribulation in every difficulty let us not give up and say well the Lord he's not hearing me you know what the problem is God has three ways of answering requests but we only know of two we think that when we make a request of God uh, God uh, can answer yes or he can answer no but God can also answer wait and we don't like that answer because we live in a society where people want immediate gratification I want it and I want it now if I have a headache, give me a Tylenol. You know, if, 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 if I have back pain, give me some pills. Take it away now, right away. We live in a period where people expect immediate gratification. And we get uh, accustomed to that. But we need to learn to suffer long. We need to learn to persevere, to always pray, never give up. And God eventually we know will deliver his people and we will live in a better land where all trials will come to an end Amen. the taste the test of faith will be finished <laughs> and we will no longer live by faith we will live by sight Amen. i don't know about you i'm looking forward to that day are you looking forward to that day Amen. so remember the story of the widow mm -hmm. father in heaven we thank you for this um, wonderful parable that you led your son Jesus to tell while he was on earth. We thank you for all the other stories as well that we find in scripture that illustrate this parable. Father, we see this world torn apart. Hurricanes one after another as, as we've never seen. And uh, earthquakes in different places. Riots taking place. Wars and rumors of wars. The world is definitely falling apart. And this is going to lead eventually to a time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. The powers of the world, united with the powers of evil, are going to try and find someone to blame for all of this, and it will be the remnant. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to learn to trust in you, to pray without ceasing, and to not give up no matter what. Because we know that after the trial and after the delay, you will intervene and we will be delivered and live in a land where there will no longer be sorrow and crying and pain and trials and difficulties. We will live in a land where everything will be joy forevermore. We look forward to being there. Help us and strengthen us in the trial that comes before. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.